Hello, folks. Welcome back to <laughs> Introduction to Literary Criticism. Um, this will be a lecture on Module Three's Post-Structuralism, and the worksheet for that is due a week from today, February 7th. Um, as Module Three shows you, there are <clears throat> also three possible questions you could uh, answer for the worksheet, uh, you know, one of the three. <clears throat> and I will sort of attack these uh, pretty much one by one. Uh, so we'll look at Derrida first. That's how you pronounce his name, Jacques Derrida. And then uh, Roland Barth and Michel Foucault, all three of whom, by the way, are uh, or were French philosophers. And uh, this last question, like the previous question on you know, criticism and structuralism, it's sort of a open-ended question about uh, you know what are the potential problems or limitations of this theory or approach. Um, so we'll you know, proceed here in order of these readings uh, in this video lecture. <clears throat> um, I wanna mention though, uh, kind of keep in mind that what we're doing here is you know, sort of going school by school, if you will, <laughs> through different literary theories. And this analogy here of the lens is, you know, pretty apt, <clears throat> which is to say, you know, if you're you're reading a text over here, whether it's a novel, poem, play, or whatever, um, you're learning to use in this course different lenses or theoretical approaches by which you may interpret that text. Um, typically, in the late 20th century and early 21st century in our current era, uh, we no longer simply hew to or glom onto one particular theoretical approach. In fact, uh, we often are pluralists, so to speak, and we, we borrow from different uh, schools of thought. So like here, it talks about you know, feminist theory, so you may use some of that, or you may use some race theory or some post-colonial theory or all of the above, so to speak. And post uh, excuse me, post-structuralism, also known by its uh, other name, deconstruction, as Barry has it here. Uh, so we'll use those terms somewhat interchangeably. Um, <clears throat> this this particular theoretical approach is, uh, I can pretty safely say uh, without a doubt that it's the toughest to kind of wrap your head around and think about throughout the entire course. Um, so, um, <clears throat> yeah, let's uh, dive in here. And uh, I'll do that by first looking at the uh, handout or the approach file that's in your Google Drive. And <clears throat> remember, this is, as the title suggests, this is coming after structuralism. So last week or a week or so ago, we talked about <clears throat> the sign comprised of the signified and the signifier that um, Ferdinand de Saussure came up with. And then we looked at Claude Levi-Strauss's application of that binary opposition in his examination of myth and structures of myth. <clears throat> so here in this school of thought in post-structuralism, we're both building upon structuralism, but also rejecting a lot of what they have to say. So remember that for uh, structuralists, they believe that um, the wor world is constituted through language, that, you know, 
uh, we can only perceive the world through language. And uh, post-structuralists, they <clears throat> in effect reject that by first saying that, well, language is an imprecise medium or tool um, and therefore we can't rely on any kind of certainty or structure within language, right? And um, there is no absolute fixity or absoluteness in the world. You know, there is no capital T truth. <laughs> um, and therefore uh, the world is not centered, which is uh, a notion that Derrida particularly drives home in his essay. <clears throat> and instead there are what uh, Marxists would term these grand narratives um, like uh, democracy and capitalism and uh, you know the Christianity as you know being <clears throat> these large broad stories, if you will, that societies tell themselves about what is right or what is wrong or best or better. And uh, they end up by saying, particularly there, the, that the best we can hope for is to interrogate our language and accept, even revel in uh, jouissance, which is the French for joyfulness or joy, um, and revel in the play and meaningfulness of language. So notice I have that word in quotation marks. If you go back to the, uh, the question here, that's in fact the very first question uh, that you could uh, attack or answer. <clears throat> it says, according to Jacques Derrida, how is it possible that the center of language can produce slippage or play? And just what is play? So uh, his essay uh, tries to parse that out. And then, um, so, you know, there's his dates, uh, Derrida. Um, so he says here, <clears throat> again, you know, playing off of structuralism, that signs are never fully comprehended either by author or reader because there is slippage and even often complete inversion of the signified and signifier. Um, the example that Barry gives uh, has to do with the word guest versus uh, hostess or hostess. Uh, as we'll see, uh, kind of turns the word guest upside down. If you tug on it, the meaning uh, too closely or, or deeply. Um, so for uh, Derrida, uh, he wants to kind of, uh, for us anyway, to think about the, the world as being logocentric or, you know, <clears throat> the entire, uh, you know, human species is grounded in language and therefore words, right? Logos being uh, where we get the Greek word from word, Greek word for word. <clears throat> um, here it says logocentrism is juxtaposed to phonocentrism, which is sound centered, which dared, uh, which according to their the constitutes most of Western cultures privileging and pre precedence of speech over writing. So, you know, think of before, for example, Homer and uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh, that was all a phonocentric civilization before writing was invented, right? Um, you know, writing did not come full force on the scene with human beings that evolved over a long period of time. Um, so what was first, you know, centered in humans was sound, you know, speech. But then once we invented writing, uh, the word, the written word began to take precedence. And this is what he's talking about, a logocentric world. Um, <clears throat> And uh, he believes, continuing, he believes that this privileging has been a violent hierarchy and is not reversible, but instead it's possible, possible to be replaced with difference, 
<laughs> and notice is if I zoom in on that word, you'll see a little accent over the E. The word itself, as I explain here in the next section, um, it's French, right? But it is spelled exactly like the word difference, except with the accent mark over the, the E in the middle. Um, but it comes from the root of the word, difference in la française, um, <clears throat> to postpone, defer, or delay, right? That's what it means. So what Derrida is doing here with this kind of slick, kind of witty usage of the word difference, remember they're French philosophers, um, is saying that if you remember like uh, in terms of the sign, you know, uh, hovel, house, mansion, palace, and so on, right? That the full meaning of any sign or any word is ultimately deferred or delayed um, because it automatically is in relation to other words or signs. Um, <clears throat> so that's uh, kind of what I was explaining here in this last section. Um, and if you push that delaying and deferring a meaning of all words to its you know, logical conclusion, uh, as I say down here, uh, let me just read this last part. Ultimately, it means that language will endlessly be defer deferred or delayed since one word or connotation leads us to yet another and so on in a dialectical process that is back and forth over and over. This process of deferring constitutes the basis for the world having no determinate meaning. Thus the abyss, uh, the abyss of meaninglessness, nothingness, uh, what might philosophically be called nihilism. <coughs> Excuse me. Speaking of which, uh, one of the questions that you could answer deals with that very issue uh, about the limitations, right? That um, one of the critiques of this theory is that <clears throat> it invites indeterminacy right, uh, that th nothing, as I mentioned a moment ago, is absolute or fixed. And therefore, if you push it to its logical conclusion, uh, there is no certainty in the world, everything's indeterminate. Uh, and if so, there is a philosophical uh, construct for this, it's called nihilism. And if you're gonna answer this letter C, uh, <clears throat> make sure you have a sense of what nihilism is. If you just click on this link, it'll take you to the Internet Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Uh, this is at, uh, I'm trying to remember, University of, uh, well, I forget now. It used to be part of, the, I think, uh, the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy. Uh, so it's University of Tennessee at Martin is where it is now. Anyway, it's this you know long kind of uh, description of nihilism. And by the way, this guy Nietzsche uh, appears over and over again, not just, uh, I said this guy, the German philosopher Friedrich Nietzsche appears over and over again in not just uh, Barry's discussion, but of course, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, and uh, Derrida's discussion as well, because in some ways, uh, Nietzsche and his philosophy in the late 1800s in Germany, his German, uh, laid the groundwork for inviting this indeterminacy. Um, anyway, so let um, me get back to the handout here. And then finally, uh, there's this notion that Derrida describes as the trace, which really you guys sort of already know about. Uh, if you think about that chain again of, you know, house or hut, hovel, house, palace, mansion, and so on, um, <clears throat> they're all interconnected, right? And in every word, uh, in all words, really. Um, is a trace 
sort of hidden vestigial remnant of its opposite, but also all other words, right? So every sign contains a trace of other signs, especially its binary opposite. You know, you can't have a yin without a yang. You know, Barry points out you can't have good without evil and so on. Um, all of which differ from itself. Paradoxically, trace cannot be detected. It is absent and only potentially absent or to use Derrida, present by virtue of this absence, right? Um, you know, that's a conceptual idea that uh, something is, it, it's there, right? I mean, that's, if you think of a ghost, right? Like it's not actually there, but because you're able to think of the concept of a ghost, right? Um, you know, it, it exists, right? You know, a trace of it, so to speak. Um, so moving on to, uh, I mean, these are uh, the privileging of one over the other in terms of what deconstructionists prefer. Um, moving on to the actual reading here by Barry, uh, notice he also begins with, you know, uh, with structuralism, because of course that's what post-structuralists and deconstructions instruction sort of riffing off of, so to speak. Um, so, <clears throat> you know, I mentioned this, what I was talking about earlier about, uh, you know, abs no absolutes and lack of fixity. And it says here, Barry, um, the situation of being without intellectual reference points is one way of describing what post-structuralist calls the decentered universe one in which by definition we cannot know where we are since all the concepts which previously defined the center and hence also the margins have been deconstructed or undermined. Um, and when they're talking about the word center, notice it's also spelled in the British way, but um, they're talking about what Sassur, for example, assumed, which was, you know, when you say cat or dog or tree or horse, that everyone has this kind of fixed meaning of what that word is. Um, but as I mentioned a long time ago, you know, when I say the word cat, um, most, if not all of us, will come up in our heads with a different type of cat. You know, whether it's a lion or a tabby or a black cat or whatever, right? It's not the exact precise word. I, I mean, a sound image, if you will. Um, so um, this produces, you know, a lot of anxiety in people that there's no fixity or we're living in a decentered world. Um, so Barry explains this here. Uh, through a couple of examples. <laughs> he says, for instance, think of any slightly less straightforward language situation like writing to your bank, you know, writing a letter or memo, writing an essay, striking up a friendship with a stranger at a party or sending a letter of condolence. In these cases and many more, there is an almost universally felt anxiety that the language will express things we hadn't intended or convey the wrong impression or betray our ignorance, callousness, or confusion. Even when we use a phrase like, if you see what I mean, or in a manner of speaking, there's a same, <clears throat> excuse me, there is the same underlying sense that we are not really in control of the linguistic system that you're trying to, you know, using these qualifiers and markers, right? Uh, you're trying to get the person to understand what you mean, but they may not really understand, uh, you know, that I have a colleague who's constantly saying, if you see what I mean, uh, see what I'm saying, see what I'm saying, right? Um, and students may not <laughs> understand what he's saying. Um, but it's a way to kind of suggest that I have this idea I'm trying to convey with language, but language is impri uh, imprecise and not fixed, but I hope you get my meaning. <clears throat> Excuse me, hope you get my meaning. Um, so, uh, and obviously, you know, 
we have a linguistic origin, think of the linguistic sign. Um, so um, one major difference, right, that Barry points out is <clears throat> structuralism inherits uh, this confidently scientific outlook, right? If you think of both the structure, if you will, of Susser's sign, you know, so you could kind of measure it objectively, this signified and signifier, as well as like Claude Levi Strauss's, you know, demarcations of various strains or um, versions of different myths, you know, in this kind of tabular, tab tablature, you know, table way uh, in a grid. Uh, it's a very kind of methodical and uh, systematic approach to trying to understand language. However, post-structuralism, because it comes from philosophy, um, which in itself is a medium of questioning, of being skeptical of really truth-seeking, but by asking kind of fundamental questions about the world. And again, there, there's Nietzsche, um, you know, there are no facts, only interpretations, right? And if that's true, what Nietzsche said, that, you know, we can all look up in the sky and say, I see the sun, but not everyone sees the sun or the moon. Don't look at the sun, sorry. <laughs> um, you know, if we don't see the exact same moon, that is some people are colorblind or some people have distorted vision or some people have, you know, incredible, you know, superhuman vision. Uh, they see things differently than we do and vice versa. Um, then, you know, the entire world, everything that we perceive, particularly through our eyes, um, is relative. It's not fixed. Uh, and for that, uh, it's, that's a lot of, uh, you know, when he talked up here about uh, <clears throat> the anxiety it produces, um, uh, Sorry, missed it. Right here, the post-structural, post-structuralist frame of mind, which lies very much within attitudes of anxieties, which most of us experience. Um, <clears throat> this, in some ways, has been brought on by uh, an accretion or buildup of phenomenon since, you know, really predating Nietzsche, but, uh, <clears throat> but has been in full gear and continues to, to do so uh, as we live in the modern world. So this, uh, again, you have this in your uh, Google Drive folder. Um, 1882, Nietzsche declares in his work, The Gay Science, that God is dead. Um, he didn't mean, you know, God is, is dead uh, in that proper sense. What he meant, culturally speaking, was that with the rise of science and scientific inquiry, remember, think of 1850 as Charles Darwin's Origin of Species, which kind of pulled the rug out from under the creation myth and Genesis. Um, so when he says God is dead, he also said, and a lot of people don't get the follow up what he said was God is dead and now all things are possible. Um, meaning that human beings don't automatically or increasingly so, and it's true, uh, believe fervently or you know, specifically in a God or uh, in any God for that matter. Um, and all things are possible like, uh, you know, not too long after that, uh, the first world war where you know it was inconceivable before then that multiple countries would slaughter each other and you would have here over nine million people dead uh, sure you had battles and and wars but nothing on this grand of a scale with the brutal trench warfare and mustard gas during world war one um Queen Victoria in Britain died in 1901. She was the longest reigning monarch 
Um, and, you know, she reigned for over 60 years. So most people in Europe and Britain, um, like she was a, a fixed <laughs> figure, so to speak, on the throne. And when she died, that kind of destabilized the British Empire. Um, and of course, it happens right at the turn of the century. Not too long after that, Einstein produces his uh, special relativity theory of you know energy equals mass times the speed of light squared, um, which basically, uh, to give the common example that's used to explain it, um, makes us realize that in fact, uh, light, the 160 or 100, 186,000 uh, miles per second, which is represented here by the C, by uh, C, so, so mass times the constant of light squared, um, that it is in fact light, the speed of light is not fixed because the special relativity theory tells us that if you, for example, send a human being out into outer space traveling at the speed of light, 186,000 miles per second, um, that if that person is gone, say, a year traveling at that speed, but they return to Earth, that person will have aged, you know, uh, slowly because they're approaching faster and faster at the speed of light. Um, and then when that person returns, everyone that was alive with him will either be very old or dead. Uh, yeah, so the faster you approach the speed of light, the more time slows down, basically, is what Einstein is saying. And therefore, time is not both space and time. They're not fixed. Uh, 1920, William Butler Yeats, in his famous poem, Second Coming, says the center cannot hold, uh, things fall apart, which is also a phrase in that poem. Um, Heisenberg's uncertainty principle, another um, theory devoted to physics uh, or emerging out of physics, uh, basically says that, um, you know, how can we ever really understand anything because we, the human beings, are observers. And if you have an observer inside of the experiment, the, ex the observer inside of the experiment automatically throws off any objectivity or absolute truth to the results of the experiment. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, you know, World War II, uh, the beginnings and endings of it, when we had over 60 million people dying during you know, mostly the Holocaust, but in other venues as well. Uh, Linda Baines Johnson, after Kennedy in 66, finally commits to Vietnam, which was, you know, in effect, an unwinnable war, or should I say conflict, because it was never declared as a war in the United States. Uh, you know, we ended up pulling out in 1972, but much like Afghanistan, uh, there was no victory. There is no resolution to that. Uh, again, an entirely uncertain time for people living in that. And just to complicate matters even further, uh, the Anton Zandor LaVey uh, guy, uh, the founder of the Church of Satan, uh, uh, publishes his, his work and, you know, kind of establishes the, the, the Church of Satan. Uh, so, you know, God is dead in a certain way. So this uh, timeline is just to kind of give you a sense of what Barry here was talking about in terms of, you know, these anxieties and where they come from uh, and why we live perhaps in a world without fixity. Um, so there's a... <clears throat> discussion here by Barry about um, some of the language that in a particular Derrida uses. He says, uh, reality itself is textual, right? It's all based on the text, but post-structuralism develops 
what threaten to become terminal anxieties about the possibility of achieving any knowledge through language, right? Because language is an imperfect medium or tool. <clears throat> the verbal sign in its view is constantly floating free of the concept that it's supposed to designate. You could also say the linguistic sign or Sasuri sign. Thus the post-structuralist way of thinking about language involves a rather obsessive imagery based on liquids. Signs float free of what they designate. Meanings are fluid and subject to constant slippage or spillage, right? And I mention this because in the uh, first uh, question, right, I mentioned this, uh, you know, what produces play or slippage, uh, those terms are sort of used uh, interchangeably. And, and the play here, of course, does not mean like you're playing a game, um, that sense of activity, but it means like if you have, say, if you've ever felt um, a screw loose in this, you know, I mean, excuse me, the, uh, the nut around a bolt is loose, right? It goes, wiggles back and forth, or maybe your steering wheel, uh, it, you know, it moves just a little bit without actually turning the wheels. Uh, that is called play uh, when there's, again, slippage. Um, but here we're relating it to or, or applying it to the slippage and play and imprecision of language and signs. Um, right? You mentioned this earlier, you can't define night without reference to day or good without evil. Um, and this is where he talks about the word guest. Um, uh, or else they are in interfering. He's talking here again about signs or meanings of words. Uh, or else they are interfered with by their own history so that obsolete senses retain a troublesome and ghostly presence within present day usage and are likely to materialize just when we thought it was safe to use them. Thus, a seemingly innocent word like guest is etymologically cognate with hostess or hostess, which means an enemy or stranger thereby inadvertently manifesting the always potentially unwelcome status of the guest. So, you know, uh, Think of the word hostile here, right? The same root of the word. But the word guest is etymologically, meaning word origin, etymologically related to hostess or hostess. So it is true, right? That um, a guest could become hostile. And so what's happening with post-structuralist and deconstructionist is they they do that, they tug on words um, and try to discern their meaning in these kind of uh, very abstract ways, right? That kind of undermine any other unity of the text, right? Um, let me give you an example of that quickly, of, of how you could do that. And uh, one of the things that, you know, we, I've been talking about, and I want you to keep remembering is Edgar Allan Poe's, uh, you know, short story, The Oval Portrait. <laughs> keep in mind, as I mentioned, uh, that originally that short story was not called The Oval Portrait, but it was called Life and Death. Um, <clears throat> and it was uh, written and configured di differently. So this is the, you know, uh, first, uh, publication of it. And here, I want to focus on this word that appears in our version in the Barry uh, reading um, right here that is uh, in these paintings, right? Um, this is where the story for us begins. But we learn here of his, what he calls incipient delirium, right? Uh, so that having swallowed opium, right? So if we look at the word itself, delirium, um, 
<clears throat> and we go to like its word origins, right? Um, you know, on the one hand, it can mean this mental confusion, maybe even hallucinations, hallucinations, can't speak today, hallucinations. Um, but it could also mean a kind of violent excitement or frenzy, right? Not necessarily uh, hallucinating. Uh, another almost like a uh, orgiastic excitement of delirium. And if you look at the root origin here, uh, Latin, right? Meaning madness, right? Or to go even further into the, the word itself, uh, to be crazy from swerving, right? If you're, you know, a furrow is like uh, you're plowing a field and the individual plowed lines are called furrows. Um, and if you swerve, right, you're not creating a straight line, you're not being rational, you're being crazy, you're being mad. So if that's true, that delirium has that kind of, you know, root origin, so to speak, then when we look at the, uh, the story itself, because uh, the narrator tells us, remember, it's, you know, first person you can see here, I, right? I bade, I told Pedro to close every shutters, right? Um, then everything that we as the reader are reading has to be seen through the eyes, so to speak, of this delirious or near delirious mad, crazy narrator who has just dropped some opium. And therefore, uh, we could maybe read the entire story as not any kind of, you know, quasi, you know, real or verisimilitude kind of uh, fiction uh, where things, you know, look like, you know, he's really in the chateau, but instead as like maybe a dream, maybe he is actually hallucinating. And if that is the case, then that changes everything about what he says in the story of having seen, you know, this book where he learns about the story between the painter and his wife and she died and all this. And right, so maybe this is some crazy wacky dream that Poe really, you know, wanted us to kind of uh, have our heads messed with, right? Maybe Poe is gaslighting us a little bit in this story who knows but that's what the constructionists do they focus on that kind of uh, use of language uh, in this case delirium um, all right um, there is another uh, author we're going to look at right after Derrida called uh, Roland Barth and um, he takes issue with the very notion of what a text is, right? So he's also going to dis disagree with the structuralist that there's any kind of fixity or meaning with language because language is imperfect and, you know, signs defer and so on. Um, and he's going to take that, what is uncertainty uh, and determinacy about language and apply it to an entire text itself and say, well, you know, we talk about an author having written a text, whether a poem, novel, short story, whatever, but really, you know, the author, once he or she has finished the final word, put a period, you know, the end, uh, that's it. And it could sit in a drawer forever and no one would ever read it and therefore it would have no meaning, sort of like, you know, the proverbial does, you know, if a tree falls in the forest, do you hear it, right? Um, so if you don't have an audience, you don't have a reader to read the words on the page that the author wrote, then it has no meaning at all. But once the reader, there are thus, I mean, excuse me, Barr says, once the reader starts reading it, um, then meaning is uh, produced. And he says it, uh, in the final line of it, where um, Barry kind of puts it a little bit differently here, but it, Barr says in the essay, the corollary of the death of the author is the birth of the reader. So that the reader comes to life, so to speak, 
by giving meaning to the words that the author has written. And therefore, without the reader, the author cannot exist. Uh, There's a kind of inverse proportionality, I suppose, there. Um, and uh, there's Nietzsche again. Uh, this is the section where he's talking about that uh, famous essay, which is what you all will be reading, the structure, sign, and play in the discourse of the humanities in 1966 by Derrida, which is uh, this, this essay right here. Um, so in it though, Barry is uh, talking here about the decentering of our intellectual universe. So on the one hand, uh, there again, you know, between World War I and the Holocaust, um, there the, at the both micro and macro level uh, wants to decenter our notion of any kind of fixity or certainty. Um, and just to sum up here, Barry is saying, in the resulting universe, there are no absolutes or fixed points, so that the universe we live in is decentered or inherently relativistic. Instead of movement or deviation, from a known center where there's fixity and truth, all we have is free play or play as in the title of the essay has it. In the lecture, Derrida embraces this decentered universe of free play as liberating, just as Barth and the death of the author celebrates the demise of the author, not the actual person, the construct, the notion of an author as an ushering in of a joyous freedom. So in many ways, the project or approach of post-structuralism deconstruction is actually very liberating uh, in terms of its ability to analyze text from many different angles. Whereas, you know, like new criticism, you can only have one right reading uh, or structuralism, you had to have, you know, find some structure here. Uh, you know, post-structuralism sort of all bets are off and you almost have uh, a kind of, uh, you know, uh, not to make a pun, but true, you almost have free play in how to uh, negotiate your interpretation. I want to just come back to this for a second here, uh, this notion of no absolutes or fixed points, right, in the universe. Um, for some of you, or in a lot of other people as well, um, that might be an anxiety producing phenomenon to think, wait a minute, you mean what I've been told about X, Y, or Z that God exists or you know, uh, the color of orange is orange, <laughs> um, that it's not true, that it's only maybe true or little true, it's only relative. Um, that can be quite upsetting to a lot of people. Um, so many critics and theorists over the years have wanted to reject post-structuralism and deconstruction as um, going too far, if you will, in terms of applying uh, the ability to use philosophy and linguistics to interpret literature. Uh, so, let me see here. Uh, and this is where he mentions uh, that <clears throat> the terms deconstruction and post-structuralism are kind of used interchangeably. This process is given the name deconstruction, which can roughly be defined as applied post-structuralism. It is often referred to as reading against the grain or reading the text against itself with the purpose of knowing the text as it cannot know itself. Well, that's obvious, the text cannot know itself. But what I was doing a second ago of looking at the word delirium, 
and having its roots in madness. And there's a reference to opium and therefore saying, well, maybe this entire story is not, you know, quote unquote real, it's all a dream. Um, that's reading the text against itself or reading against the grain. You know, it's traditionally how people would not have read a Poe story, right? Um, yeah, so there's another reference to hostess, hostess again. Um, Yeah, the deconstructionist practice what is called textual harassment or oppositional reading, reading with the aim of unmasking internal contradictions or inconsistencies in the text, aiming to show the disunity which underlines its apparent unity, right? So if you thought, you know, the Poe story was, oh, there's this nightly, nice little package that Poe created for us, it's a story within a story, we call our frame narrative where there's a story of the painter and his wife inside the book. And then the broader story is the narrator telling us what's happening in both the book and the chateau. But that little nice little package is destabilized and inconsistent if you kind of pull or tug on the word delirium and opium in terms of it being maybe an entire hallucination of the narrator, right? Um, so yeah, kind of what deconstructionists do. All right, well, let's look at um, there the, uh, the actual, and uh, this, by the way, I apologize, folks. <laughs> I'm gonna refer back to Barry uh, when he said that your ability to understand theory and criticism um, is not you know, any intellectual capacity or lack thereof, uh, it's, it's the way that theory is written about and it's unnecessarily circumlocuted or you know, uh, dense. And uh, so this is a prime example of that. They're the sort of notoriously one of the most difficult uh, authors to understand or interpret. Of course, it was written in French and then translated into English. So there's a little bit of you know, lost in translation going on here. Um, so, you know, he's going to start off with structuralism, of course, uh, because that's what he's really aiming to um, destabilize, but also remember, they don't entirely reject the principles. In fact, he says it very clearly in this essay that, we, you know, we don't want to get rid of the structure of the sign because we need it, you know. Um, like just you can't have good without evil or night without day. You have to have both, you know. Um, but he does want to point out that it's not a perfect system and that it's, as he says here, you know, there's a rupture going on, uh, a break. Um, so here's one little paragraph I'm going to work through because, uh, again, it's not easy. Nevertheless, up to the event which I wish to mark out and define structure, or rather the structurality of structure. So it's right there, right? What? what? <laughs> Why can't you just say structure when you have to say the structurality of structure? But he means sort of, you know, how everything in a structure is ordered, right? Including the order itself, you know, if you think of the Linnaean classification system of plants and animals, you know, um, you know, it looks like a kind of upside down inverted tree, uh, you know, with individual species and subspecies coming at the bottom, you know, but at the top is the, the main trunk of, you know, either it's plant or it's an animal, uh, but the entire structure is ordered, right? It's what he's talking about, the structurality of structure. So I wish to mark out and define structure, although it has not always been at work, has always been neutralized or reduced in this process, or in this by a process of giving it a center or of referring to it as a point of presence, a fixed origin. And here, this is not difficult to understand. Um, if again, you're looking at the uh, the sign, uh, 
you know, that is the entire thing is centered, so to speak, uh, around these two components that they gravitate toward each other. In other words, uh, I think I said this last time. Um, so you have this object out there in nature, but you have a word to then describe that object. I mean, if you didn't have a word, you would be pointing to everything, right? Without verbalizing anything. So the sound image and the concept, they like the two sides of a coin, they kind of immediately like magnetism, you know, attached to each other. You can't have one without the other, right? You can't have a word without it meaning something, some concept, and you can't have, you know, some object uh, thing in your head without it having a word to then express or articulate it. Um, so he goes on to say, so, and by the way, that's him laying out what he's calling the center. The function of this center was not only to orient, balance, and organize the structure, which I just showed you with that image. One cannot, in fact, conceive of an unorganized structure, true but above all to make sure that the organizing principle of the structure would limit what we might call the play of structure. So going back to this image, what uh, he's saying here is that this very structure itself allows for no difference or variation. It, there's only two things that can occur in there, you know, inside the circle, if you will, uh, the concept and the sound image or the signified and the signifier, okay? Um, <clears throat> continuing, by orienting and organizing the coherence of the system, the center of a structure permits play of its elements inside the total form. I'll read that again. By orienting and organizing the coherence of a system, the center of a structure permits or allows the play of its elements inside the total form. And even today, the non, oh, sorry, the notion of a structure lacking any center represents the unthinkable itself, which is kind of true, right? The last part that, um, you know, if you have a structure, it's got to have some kind of center, you know, whether it's a building or a game board or, you know, in this case, the linguistic sign. But what he is also saying is that within this structure, there is for Derrida going to be what he calls some play or slippage, right? So again, if I say tree, you know, do you know if I'm talking about an oak tree, a willow tree, you know, uh, short tree, tall tree? Um, it, it's not fixed, right? We want to believe it is fixed, but Derrida is saying, well, it's not, not as easy as you think, or not as fixed as you think. Um, he'll go on to say, and this is always up here, um, in the, right hand column, first page. Thus it has always been thought that the center, which is by definition unique, right? Because the center is not the outer edges or periphery, therefore it's unique. Um, this has always been thought that the center, which is by definition unique, constituted that very thing within a structure, which while governing the structure escapes structurality which is a little convoluted, right? Like, I mean, isn't it part of the structure? Well, yes, but he's saying conceptually here that the center is not the totality. It's not the entire structure. It's only part of it. In fact, it's, it's inside of it and it can't be uh, considered the total thing, the total structure, because, you know, by definition, it's, it's not. <laughs> 
It's only interior to the larger thing. This is why classical thought concerning structure could say that the center is paradoxically within the structure and outside it. What? This is again, what I mean by the difficulty of reading there though. How can it be both? The center is at the center of the totality or the center of the structure. And yet, since the center does not belong to the totality, the totality has its center elsewhere or dot, 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 the center is not the center. <laughs> well, how does it get there? Well, um, I know, kind of baffling. Let's take something we're all familiar with, a baseball. And so, you know, this could be, instead of a linguistic sign, could be, you know, another way to understand what he's saying here. So he's saying that the center, notice here, it says that a baseball has a cork center, pill here, meaning it's not like a solid piece of cork that you might find or typically find as the cork when you pull out of a wine, wine bottle. But instead, it's uh, little bits, little shavings of the substance cork. Um, so it has a baseball center of cork, shavings, compressed cork shavings, basically, which gives it a kind of, you know, not only structure, roundness, but also uh, a little bit of give, right? If you've ever thrown a baseball on the ground and it kind of bounce back up, because there is also rubber inside of it, as you can see. But what he's saying is the structurality, the entire totality, this is a baseball itself. And the center is unique in that it's the center. But he's also saying that because the center is part of the entire structure, but it's not the entire structure also, um, that is both within, it's obviously within it, but the notion, the concept of center is outside of it somewhere. That this, this thing, if you could, you know, conceptually, intellectually, just take this cork center and put it here in the corner, right? Then you would see that, oh, it is unique. It can stand on its own and therefore is not part of the entire structure but also leaving it in there because it is at the center, therefore it's part of the totality. So he's trying to have it obviously both ways. <clears throat> and this is how he ends up with the center is not the center. You may not agree with him based on that uh, line of reasoning. A lot of people uh, don't, that's fine. Um, but, He's basically going to make the, the argument that um, there is no, <clears throat> you know, he keeps talking about decentering, there is no fixity because, well, first of all, there never was, but um, the notion that we would think that everyone sees the same tree or same cat, or, or, you know, when you read those words on a page, cat, dog, house, hovel, mansion, uh, we all interpret those differently. Um, you know, one day in, in class, when I was doing this in person, I asked students, because it's mentioned right at the opening of uh, the oval portrait, you know, what the word chateau meant. And of course, you might expect, we've got quite a range of different descriptions of what a chateau is or could be. That's because the meaning isn't fixed, right? <clears throat> and this is what he's saying here. Henceforth, it was necessary to begin thinking that there was no center. And he's really here again talking about the linguistic sign, the signified and signifier, that the center could not be thought <clears throat> 
in the form of a present being, that the center had no natural site, that it was not a fixed locus or location, but a function, a sort of non-locus in which an infinite number of signs came into play. This is that notion of deferring, right? That things automatically refer to each other without having to even mention them because they're all interconnected. This was the moment when language invaded the universal problematic, the moment when, in the absence of a center or fixity of language or origin, everything became discourse, provided we can agree on this word. That is to say, a system in which the central signified the original or transcendental signified is never absolutely present outside a system of differences, which is not what Satsura was saying. The absence of the transcendental signified extends to the domain and the play of signification or meaning infinitely. So this is you know, I mentioned this, I think, a time or two ago, you know, that notion that we know something by which it is not, right? So the, by which it is not part is the absence of something. So the absence of the transcendental signified here, this word, uh, honestly, for him, it approaches God um, in that kind of, you know, he, he mentions it up here, um, that, um, you know, if you want to think of something like consciousness or God, uh, some might say soul, right? Uh, coming from our sense of, you know, existence or being in the world. Uh, here he's getting into some, you know, metaphysics, obviously. Um, it's because that all of these words, whether God or love or soul, um, they have or they reach toward or point toward or signify a higher meaning, a kind of transcendental meaning, like, you know, what is God? Well, it's kind of this all-encompassing notion, you know, what is the Christian theology that, <clears throat> you, got, you know, Alpha to Omega always was and will be, or, you know, it's omniscient, omnipresent, and, uh, uh, sorry, the third one, uh, omniscient, omnipresent, and omnipotent, sorry. Um, <clears throat> so, uh, yeah, this is what he's driving at in terms of the center. Um, so, I mean, I don't know if you, you all buy this. Uh, there's Nietzsche again. Um, but <clears throat> a lot of people and have and continue to in some ways still use the slippage, if you will, of language, the imprecision of language to interpret texts, you know? Um, so you could do that as well if you wanted to, if this is, you know, your theory, uh, your approach, you like, uh, this is where he's uh, directly taking on Claude Levi-Strauss, remember the other uh, structuralists that we talked about. Um, and he's, he's talking specifically about um, a book of his, of Levi Strauss's um, over here of elementary structures um, and the savage mind. Those are texts that uh, he's taking apart here. Um, so there's this term called bricolage, which uh, unfortunately this semester, just because the number of weeks, you know, spring break and the, uh, what do you call it? The Mardi Gras break, uh, I had to cut a school of thought or theory. And normally I would have had a component on what's called postmodernism, And when we would talk about uh, bricolage, uh, but kind of, Basically, a bricolage is, uh, it's a French word. Uh, it's a mishmash uh, collection, if you will, of different things put together, right? Uh, what we might call an art mixed media, right? Uh, so 
any of these definitions might apply. So if we go down to the uh, French word, right? Uh, it comes from a person who's a bricolaire to do odd jobs, right? Um, or the French zigzagging to bounce off of. Again, that kind of swerving idea. Again, not linear. So he's mentioning uh, the bricolaire because Levi Strauss, again, also French, uh, but an anthropologist, uh, was bringing it up and therefore Derrida wants to use this word bricolage, right? Because um, if you think about it, <clears throat> that in some ways is the, uh, is the kind of nature of language, right? So there you go, bricolage. Uh, you know, you could call that a art installation of mixed media, different, different things. And you might think, well, that's just a wall full of junk, right? No, no. <laughs> I mean, it is in one person's estimation or definition, but uh, an artist very specifically chose each one of these and placed each one of these in a specific, uh, you know, position, right? Because some are close to the wall, some are against another wall, and so on. Um, so bricolage, right? different things, but he's using that word uh, or will be using that word to uh, say that that's really what uh, language is about, right? Um, <clears throat> he says, if one calls bricolage the necessity of borrowing one's concepts from the text of heritage, which is more or less coherent or ruined, it must be said that every discourse is bricolure. Um, and of course, he's referring to, uh, remember that Levi Strauss was taking the one of uh, the stories, the Oedipus story, and looking at different versions of it, right? Uh, we might call it mythopoesis or mythopoetic. Um, and therefore, each one of those constitutes, each one of those versions constitutes a different story and Levi Strauss is putting them all together like a bricolage, as I showed you with those images. Um, and if that's true, that a bricolage is a kind of metaphor for language, then um, yeah, you know, maybe there does onto something here. In fact, he mentions a little bit earlier, kind of went beyond it um, when he's talking about the transcendental. Here he says. Uh, the history of metaphors and metonymies. So um, if, and you'll hear this on the news all the time. Well, today the Pentagon released a description of what happened in Afghanistan, right? So a metonymy is a, one of many uh, figures of speech, right? There are many, many, many. Irony is one, so on. So uh, when someone says the Pentagon, released a statement, the building itself is an inanimate object, right? It can't release a statement. Human beings can, um, but this image, this conceptual idea of the Pentagon representing the Department of Defense, right? Uh, works in the same way we might say, well, um, the White House released a press statement saying blah, blah, blah. Well, again, a house cannot, you know, <laughs> make an action like that or take an action like that. Um, what is being referred to, of course, is the president or the administration uh, under the president. And so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it's not a precise definition, right? Like, uh, we, we use these all the time. Why, why not just say the president released a press statement today or the secretary of defense released a secretary today? Well, we don't have to because we have the ability in our minds, right? To come up with uh, these constructs, you know, these mental uh, metaphors, uh, in this case, the metonymy which again, we use all the time. 
So, um, you know, going back to that question, you know, so what is the center and what is play? You know, do you, do you agree with their thought here? Uh, it's, uh, it's, it's simultaneously easy and difficult to understand what the center is because, um, you know, he wants to have it both ways, but also uh, it's also simultaneously easy and hard to understand what slippage of play is because um, you know what it is, you know, like <laughs> when you tell someone to do something and you think in your mind, it's totally clear that you meant to pick up this, that, or the other from the store, but they come back with something not exactly that you had envisioned, right? No, 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 I meant this, right? <laughs> right, and therefore we have to say words like that, I meant, right? Here's my signification and where it broke down in terms of what you interpreted or thought. Um, that's the slippage, right? That's the play or, and, you know, might call it playfulness because uh, certainly deconstructionists like, like to use the play of language. Um, and so, uh, you know, it's, uh, it happens to us all the time. Uh, and and there the, in many respects is right. That uh, language of course is imperfect. And, you know, whether or not we, don't have any consensual meaning that's a different story right like you know most of us can probably you know if we were you know had a lineup so to speak of of colors on a wall we could walk over to some portion of the wall let's say there's a rainbow there right and we could say okay this this is the color blue right but not everyone would be able to do that especially those who are colorblind right which is why we have colorblind tests. All right, let's move on to uh, these two guys, uh, Fouchel, Foucault, oh, sorry, Michel Foucault and Roland Barth. Um, so I'm gonna take Barth first um, because he's kind of riffing off of Levi-Strauss as well and structuralists, um, but he's gonna kind of also agree in a certain way with, uh, what do you call it, uh, with the, there the. So here in 1968, we have this essay called The Death of the Author. And, and folks here, just keep in mind that we're not talking about the actual human being author. We're talking about the construct or the category, if you will, of author. So, and let me help you contextualize this. Um, the, you know, what we might call textual triangle. Uh, of author, text, reader, right? Um, so, um, Let's see if this is, it's not the one. So this is a pretty simple idea to understand um, that you have, uh, you know, an author, actual human being, um, or it could be multiple authors, right? Whose brains and imaginations conceive of a screenplay, a poem, whatever genre, and then a text is produced. Okay, so there's that line. But then the text, if it sits in a drawer and is never read, then no one would ever be able to know what the authors intended. Well, that's a tricky one because we're supposed to avoid the intentional fallacy. But once a text or texts, plural, is read by a reader, right? Then according to uh, Barth here, that's when meaning of all the words and the story itself comes into existence. And so the construct, not the actual human beings, but the construct 
and category of author dies away as you, the reader, bring meaning to the words on the page. Okay, so um, it's not really a difficult uh, thing to, to grasp. He says here, the author, uh, it, oh, this is still the, uh, the introductory section by the Norton Anthology editors. Um, the author, the text, and the reader are each composed of a universe of quotations without origin and end. This is what Barth has been saying. In its celebration of the birth of the reader, the death of the author, this, the essay, explores the consequences of freeing the reading process from the constraints of fidelity to an origin, a unified meaning and identity, or any other pre-given exterior or interior reality. And um, I'll just read that last part again, because that's exactly what Barth is saying. And the connection you need to make between Derrida and Barth is that they're both attacking, so to speak, uh, criticizing structuralism for being so rigid in its conception is not to allow any kind of other possibilities. So whereas Derrida says, you know, well, look, you know, meaning is not fixed and therefore there are traces of words and all other words and, you know, meaning is internally delayed and deferred. Barth is saying when it comes to, you know, the, again, author text reader categories that um, the author begins to sort of wash away or die as you know this kind of upheld category of oh Poe or oh Shakespeare or oh Chaucer or whatever author and begins to uh, allow you the reader or me the reader us to pour meaning or inhere meaning into whatever was written on the page. Um, so let's look at what, some of what Barth has to say here. Um, as soon as a fact is narrated, think of the Edgar Allan Poe story where you know it's I, the narrator, speaking, the wounded, you know, almost delirious narrator. As soon as a fact is narrated, no longer with a view to acting directly on reality, but intransitively, that is to say, finally outside any function other than that of the very practice of the symbol itself, this, dis this disconnection occurs, the voice loses its origin, the author enters into his own death and writing begins. So I know it seems a bit dramatic uh, to say that, um, but he's saying, you know, that notice he's talking here about the function of the category of the author. And he goes on to explain what he means here that, you know, the modern author as we know it, right, is a product or the author is a modern figure is, is a product of our society insofar as emerging from the Middle Ages with English empiricism type of philosophy, right, that, you know, you know things by touching them, think of John Locke, uh, French rationalism and the personal faith of the Reformation, it discovered the prestige of the individual of, as it more nobly put, the human person, which is why, you know, historically we've given so much attention to authors. We even have it, uh, we haven't taught it in a while, but it's on our books, our catalog, we even have a course at Gremlin called Major Literary Figures, you know? Uh, so rather than having uh, a course like African-American literature, which you could have many women and many uh, male authors, right, all together, uh, a course like Major Literary Figures are focused singularly on one author the entire semester, like, the course you all are required to take, which is 
English 404 Shakespeare, All right? That's the kind of uh, construct that he's talking about here when he says, you know, the modern figure of the author uh, or the human person. But what Barth wants to remind us is that, you know, when and where and how do we draw the line of what constitutes an author in terms of what they've written and how they've written it, right? He says the author still reigns in histories of literature, biographies of writers, interviews, magazines, as in the very consciousness of men of letters, anxious to unite their person and their works through diaries and memoirs, right? So we have all of these things that authors have written, right? Um, but what if, would you take, for example, uh, things that have been written in the margin, you know, like, uh, it's not in this, oh, that would be a, uh, if, if uh, an author, you know, pick your author, it doesn't matter, <clears throat> wrote, scribbled on a napkin or wrote a post-it note, you know, notes on a refrigerator, would you consider that, you know, part of the oeuvre, we call that part of the collected works of an author? I mean, most of us probably wouldn't, but, you know, it begs the question like, okay, well, when we're saying Shakespeare, right, do we take his you know, uh, the receipts from his sale at the Globe or another theater, do we take those as part of his literary corpus, you know? Um, by the way, I, I used that word a second ago. Um, it's just a, a word you ought to know, also a French word. Um, it means the typically the way we use it, uh, the the totality of an author's work, uh, and the way you pronounce that is oeuvre. So, um, um, he says here. Notice the capital A there, right? Um, that it's like a category. You know, the the sway of the author remains powerful. And he's going to list a bunch of authors here, you know, mostly French, you know, because he's a French author. Um, but he's he's basically going to end up saying this, and I'll just uh, uh, kind of skip to the chase here. This is the final lines of this essay. Classic criticism has never paid any attention to the reader. For it, the writer is the only person in the literature. Right? I mean, Cicero, Seneca, Homer. Oh, by the way, who is Homer? We don't know. I mean, that's a good, uh, to go back to this, this representation here, right? So we have this category called author in which we have poured into this particular work, the Iliad, the Odyssey, this person called Homer. Well, that there is no person called Homer. <laughs> there was no historical, like, like we know for a fact, there was Jesus Christ, historical figure, we know that. But Homer, um, you know, like the author of the Epic of Gilgamesh, Gilgamesh did not write <laughs> the Epic. Um, so these are, you know, categories that are made up just like the Beowulf poet, you know, um, we don't even have a name. We just say the Beowulf poet, <laughs> um, because we don't know who it was. Um, but this is what he's, he's saying here that, um, you know, classic criticism, like, you know, new criticism, for example, T.S. Eliot. Um, they never paid any attention to the reader for like new criticism. The writer is the only person in literature. Uh, and they don't mean for new criticism, you know, like they're going to study the biography, but they're, they're definitely studying the text that the author wrote. He says here, 
we are now beginning to let ourselves be fooled no longer by the arrogant anti frastical recriminations of good society in favor of the very thing it sets aside, ignores, smothers, or destroys. We know that to give writing its future, it is necessary to overthrow the myth. And then he ends here with the famous line, the birth of the reader, you and me, right? That is how we read, interpret, understand things. The birth of us must be at the cost of the death of the author, capital A, right? So, I mean, again, not too difficult to wrap your head around, but it's certainly a far cry from the new critics who, you know, they're like, well, we can only look at the words on the page and you know, there's only one right reading. This is how you have to do it. Um, now with post-structuralism and Barth's notion of the death of the author that we can uh, basically be liberated and therefore put all kinds of meaning in the text because we, the reader, have the power to do so, right? That's kind of amazing, uh, you know, all these various uh, possible interpretations, which, you know, like the deferred word and meaning uh, in Derrida or the decentered universe, uh, can cause problems because you could theoretically say with this notion, well, there's a sonnet on the page and every one of the 20 students in class has read it. And every one of those students interpretation is equally valid. And therefore we can never arrive, arrive at any kind of concrete or fixed meaning. And then everything is just whatever we want it to be. And it gets more problematic if you apply this line of reasoning to say something like the Bible. Oh, so Martin Luther says uh, very clearly at the end of one of his letters that um, it's the duty of every Christian to espouse, profess, and point out any errors in the word itself. And therefore every Christian is supposed to read the Bible. But if every Christian reads it differently, because you know readers have the ability to bring meaning to the text, <clears throat> then um, you know there's not going to be any constituality of agreement. There's going to be fights, and guess what? There are <laughs> in the religious world, particularly over the Bible. Well, let's finally move on to the last author, Michel Foucault, uh, <clears throat> one of the most important uh, European philosophers, along with Derrida. Um, we will talk a bit about uh, his mentor, if you will, <clears throat> Louis Althusser, when we get to Marxism. Um, Foucault is interested in <clears throat> systems of, as it says up here, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, systems of, or structures, I should say, of society that force uh, oppression of people and cause their identities to be constructed in certain ways. So whether it's, you know, in medicine or prisons, you know, the, the justice system, um, he, he really kind of like hospitals, prisons, military schools, so on. Um, he really looked at what was happening with these institutions in terms of what we call identity formation of, of creating the subject, we call it. Uh, we are all subjects, uh, human beings are subjects. Um, so um, he's going to deliberately riff off of Barth's what is uh, the death of an author and come up with this essay called What is an Author? So, you know, going back to Barth here, this is 1968, you know, the ending of Barth's essay. So 1968, he says, you know, the birth of the reader must come at the cost of the death of the author, capital A, construct or category of author. And Foucault is going to say the very next year, 1969, well, wait, what is an author? You know, like what is, let's step back in even further and think about what, what do we call an author? Um, so um, 
he's going to basically say that um, it's a category that we, the reader, should abandon, right? That in this essay, he writes that the subject should not be entirely abandoned, um, but needs to be reconsidered. <clears throat> that, that is um, kind of like the signified and signifier. You can't have one without the other. But he is going to say, if you're going to talk about the author, you need to talk in more complicated and uh, encompassing terms than you know, T.S. Eliot, who wrote this poem called The Love Song of Geoffrey Prufrock, or Shakespeare, who wrote this play. You need to talk in much broader um, so social and institutional terms. Um, so let me give you an example of what he means or says. <clears throat> um, he's mentioning that he, uh, in this work called The Order of Things, um, which was a 1966 work, uh, that he had allowed uh, the function, if you will, of the authors to be ambiguous. And he's going to use that word function over and over again, uh, come up with a phrase for it. Um, so here he says, um, I will set aside a social historical analysis of the author as an individual and the numerous questions that deserve attention in this context, how the author was individualized in a culture such as ours, the status we have given the author, for instance, when we began our research into authenticity and attribution, the systems of valorization or legitimization in which he was included, or the moment when the stories of heroes gave way to the author's biography, the conditions that fostered the formulation of the fundamental categories of the man in his work, All right? So he's gonna like, I'm gonna, those are all things that I could talk about in what he calls the social historical analysis, but he's gonna set those questions aside. He says, for the time being, I wish to restrict myself to the singular relationship that holds between the author and the text, okay? Um, because all of these things that he mentions before, they do occur, you know, think of biography, right? But that's, you know, Shakespeare's biography or whatever. Uh, Tony Morrison, those occur after the author typically is gone, right? And so they're not really the author in the text itself. Um, so, um, you know, he's going to kind of riff off of Barth here and talk about death. Um, because in a certain way, he, he is killing off the author as well, but coming up with a different answer than what uh, Barth is doing. Um, <clears throat> here's Nietzsche again. Uh, oh yeah, so <clears throat> assuming that we were dealing with an author, it's everything he wrote and said, everything he left behind to be included in his works. This is kind of what I was driving at a moment ago with Barth. Um, so like, you know, a note on the refrigerator door, like everything, um, you know, he scribbled on, I don't know, uh, an insurance form, you know, do we consider that part of his work? This problem is both theoretical and practical. If we wish to publish the complete works of Nietzsche or Shakespeare or Chaucer or whomever, where do we draw the line? Certainly everything must be published, but can we agree on what everything means, right? We will, of course, include everything that Nietzsche himself published, along with the drafts of his work, his plans for aphorisms, his marginal uh, notations and reject uh, reactions, or sorry, no corrections, my bad. <clears throat> but what if in a notebook filled with aphorisms, we find a reference, a reminder of an appointment, an address or a laundry bill, should this be included in his works? Why not, right? I mean, well, he did write it, so why shouldn't or couldn't we include that? What he's, he's driving at here is that when we 
when we say, oh, we're gonna publish everything Shakespeare wrote, or we're gonna publish whatever X author wrote, that this word everything is defined by human beings, typically by you know, scholars and professors. And therefore, not everyone is going to agree with what is and isn't included. Uh, but also, it makes it, you know, he's arguing for Go that it gives us a kind of false sense of what really constitutes the totality of an author. Um, he's going to call this uh, phenomenon the author function. Uh, you know, when we say Aristotle, are we using a word that means one or a series of definite descriptions of the type, the author of you know, this work, the analytics or poetics or whatever Aristotle wrote, or the founder of ontology, which you know, Aristotle did. Um, The disclosure that Shakespeare was not born in the house that tourists now visit, which is true, by the way, there was a place in Stratford-upon-Avon that people thought was where he lived, but in fact, it's actually not, we learn. So um, the, the revelation or disclosure that Shakespeare was not born in the house that tourists now uh, visit would not modify, not change the functioning of the author's name, but if it were proved that he had not written the sonnets that we attribute to him, this would constitute a significant change and affect the manner in which the author's name functions, right? So if you know, we learn that Shakespeare didn't in fact write one or more of those 154 sonnets, then we would go, whoa, whoa, okay, that's not the author we thought. Maybe we shouldn't, you know, hold him or her up to that kind of lofty standard of having every English major take a required course. Um, footnote here, I don't know if you guys have taken Shakespeare or if uh, my colleague, Dr. Wilson mentions this, but, um, you know, he wrote 154 sonnets and, you know, many tragedies, comedies and histories, um, plays, right? But we have literally zero of Shakespeare's own handwriting, what we call a holograph or autograph, uh, writing in any of those works. In other words, we have zero handwritten works by Shakespeare. The only thing we have are printed um, copies, if you will, of what his fellow actors, because uh, he was also an actor, uh, put together in memory after he died. Or sometimes when he was alive, they were, of course, printed. But, but he never, you know, that we have any manuscript evidence for, wrote them down. So uh, that right there is a kind of evidence of like, we've really, according to Foucault, really kind of created this, you know, grand category of capital A author for Shakespeare, when in fact, we don't have any of his, you know, original manuscripts for those works. Um, so, I'm trying to find, uh, so where he's getting to this uh, idea of the author function. The author's name is not a function of a man's civil status, nor is it fictional. It is situated in the breach that is in between. Think of, you know, house, hovel, hut, mansion, palace, right? It, um, sort of, we know something about which it is not, the in-betweenness um, among the discontinuities, which gives rise to new groups of discourse and their singular modes of existence. Consequently, we can say that in our culture, the name of an author is a variable that accompanies only certain texts to the exclusion of others. A private letter may have a signatory, like you know, someone signing it, but it does not have an author. A contract can have, like an insurance contract, a contract can have an underwriter, 
but not an author. And similarly, an anonymous poster, like a poster on a wall, attached to a wall may have a writer, but he cannot be an author, right? Like, I mean, there's a poster on the wall that has words on the page or on the poster, but we don't usually typically have an author sign a poster, right? It's just, you know, some artist or, you know, someone, someone created it, right? In this sense, the function of an author is to characterize the existence, circulation, operation of certain discourses within the society. So this is where uh, Foucault is really broadening out and saying, okay, wait a minute. All right, Barthes, you're talking about the death of an author, but I want us to step back even further and say, well, what is the category of an author and how does it function? Well, he says it, it has a certain kind of work in society, like the word work in quotation marks. Um, so this is what he's driving at when he's uh, talking about what he derives here called the author function. Um, it, it's a helpful kind of useful category, but we need to realize that it's not about the individual person, the human being, the living, breathing person, or maybe dead person, right? So uh, that's uh, question B about, you know, uh, do you buy any of this, you know, that they're talking about in terms of, you know, the author no longer exists or, you know, what is the author function? Uh, you can answer those questions. All right, folks, I think that's about it for our, uh, our readings here, okay? Uh, and this will form this video lecture that I will post uh, today, January 31st, and this worksheet will be due a week from today on February 7th. All right, that's it. Hope you all are well. Take care, bye-bye.